in lecture eight, we are going to study development in the early embryo, you know, and how the gametes get together and all that in the mammal. So we're going to talk a lot about what happens in humans. This is very interesting. Um, we need to talk about first follicular development. Um, a woman starts cycling and goes into puberty. And it varies greatly, anywhere from 12 years old occasionally all the way up to 15 or 16, sometimes 17 even. That's very rare these days. It used to be normal, a lot more normal. But with good nutrition, most adolescent girls are ready to begin cycling fairly early on, in their early teens at least. All right. If we look at uh, the development of follicles in an embryo, we will see Cycling becomes a thing, a part of their life, starting at puberty. During her reproductive lifespan of about 35 years or so, she will produce approximately 200 eggs from each of her two ovaries, or for a lifetime production of about 400 eggs. Now, obviously, she's not going to get pregnant 400 times. Uh, that wouldn't happen. But starting at puberty, what we see happening is all those eggs that were stored up since before her birth in her ovaries now start to respond to a couple of hormones produced by her anterior pituitary gland. If you don't remember that, go back to the infamous figure C on reproductive cycles and look at it again. We have four important uh, hormones that are controlling this cycling for the next 35 years in the woman's life. Or so, <clears throat> two of the hormones, FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, come from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland out of the base of the brain. Um, the other two come from the ovary or the tissues that are developing in the ovary. They are, um, let's see, estrogen and progesterone. Now, the woman doesn't start making FSH, uh, until, uh, she doesn't start puberty until, oh, she's in her early teens, let's say. And at that point, she will, by atresia or attrition, having lost, most of the eggs inside her uh, ovaries. She started out with several million of them, a few million, when she was a newborn little baby girl. But all the years of adolescence before she got to puberty, she, by atresia, that is, by cell death, she lost every month more and more and more. And so when we get down to puberty, she's down to less than a million of them that are still left, and she will draw from that lot, even though atresia continues all the way on up until we get to menopause. She will draw from that lot in her two ovaries of prospective eggs, okay, the oogonia. She will draw a couple of hundred each month. It's called recruiting of all the ones left inside her ovaries each month, she will start approximately 100 per ovary, or about 200 potential eggs, to developing into a rapid sequence of development, getting ready to, to be released and possibly to be fertilized in a pre and with a pregnancy resulting. So starting at puberty, she begins to make FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, from her anterior pituitary gland, and it causes these stored-up uh, follicles. A follicle is a nest of ovary cells, right in the middle of which is an ovum, an egg. And of the hundreds of thousands that she has left starting in puberty, she will recruit a couple of hundred per cycle to start this process of maturation. But she only produces enough FSH to allow her to take one to total mag uh, total uh, what um, maturity and to be ovulated 
in any given cycle. 199 of the 200 that she starts by recruiting, they'll die on the way. They will never make it and never leave the ovary and they will just disintegrate inside the ovary. But the one that does make it, that's the one that has the chance to get pregnant, to start a pregnancy. All right, starting at puberty, each month she recruits a couple of hundred. A month is a menstrual month of approximately 28 days. Ladies, if yours are not 28 days, that's not a big deal. Uh, some women are naturally 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 days. 28 is just the statistical normal. Uh, it turns out that's a monthly lunar cycle too. Anyway, here we see a follicle being stimulated and it's the layer of follicle cells on the outside gets bigger and bigger and thicker and thicker and eventually what happens is this follicle will hollow out and the egg will be stuck out into the center or cavity, the antrum it's called, of this follicle on a little pedestal right there. And then about day 14, she will put so much fluid in here that when a second anterior pituitary hormone, LH, luteinizing hormone, comes along and affects these cells on the outside of her follicle. They get brittle and they'll crack open. Now, ovulation is the process of an egg being ejected from the inside of a matured uh, follicle like this. This is ovulation. And what comes out is what's on this little pedestal right here, the egg a clear area around it called the zona pellucida. Interesting uh, structure, that zona pellucida. Um, if you put a human egg in a Petri dish with some um, uh, fish, I'm making up something weird here, fish sperm, it won't fertilize because the zona pellucida lends a species specificity, which means that only human sperm can get through the zona pellucida of a human egg to get inside. Um, you can put sperm from other, in a petri dish, out in a laboratory experiment, from other species in with the egg and it's not going to get, you're not going to get fertilization. The zona pellucida, the innermost lining or layer right there around the egg, protects the egg, and on the outside of that there is a several cell layer thick plating of these follicle cells that were up inside, the, they came from up inside the ovary. They are ovary cells. Most of them are left behind when ovulation occurs. But the follicle cells right here protect that zona pellucida and the egg inside of it. What happens to this old hulk What's left, husk, what's left of this um, follicle is it knots up into a lump. And that lump then will wait around to see if a, if a pregnancy occurs. If it doesn't, that lump called a corpus luteum. Remember, LH caused this ovulation to occur. LH also causes a corpus luteum luteinizing hormone, corpus luteum, to form. And the corpus luteum will stay there in case there's a pregnancy. And of a majority of time, I mean, how many cycles have you had, ladies? How many times have you been pregnant? The vast majority of the eggs never get, never get fertilized. And so, in the vast majority of cases, the corpus luteum will just disintegrate and go away. Now, if there happen to be sperm in the vicinity of this ovulated egg right here, they are immediately going to swim up to the outside and at least 200 of them are going to attack those follicle cells that are tightly glued together, those cells are, glued together by a, an organic glue called hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid. Now, in the very front end of a sperm, remember, we said there is a little sac called an acrosome and it contains lytic enzymes, one of which is an enzyme that breaks down hyaluronic acid. It's called hyaluronidase. And so when 200 sperm come up to all this multi-layered follicle cell envelope around the outside of the egg, 
they all donate their little tiny droplet of hyaluronidase from their acrosomes, and that's enough to start the cells, the follicle cells, to begin falling away. Eventually, a chink in the armor will occur, a thin spot in the follicle cell covering around here will occur, and one sperm will make it in, will combine with the egg, and we will have fertilization. Once it gets in, it changes the texture and the characteristics of the outer membrane of this, of this egg cell to the point where it toughens up and no second sperm can get in. No polyspermy can occur. It's as if the first sperm in shuts the door and locks it behind him, and no second sperm can get in. Wow. All right. Um, we said that in a previous lecture that if the, a pregnancy does occur, the corpus luteum is going to change, and it's going to become a white body, albino white, a corpus albicans, corpora albicans. And that white body will play a very important role in the development of the pregnancy. And uh, I, as you remember, I told you a rather gratuitous, weird story about how that the uh, corpora albicans stays in the ovary of the woman for the rest of her life. So you can examine the ovaries of a woman and see how many times she has been pregnant. Now, remember, two-thirds of all human pregnancies approximately spontaneously abort. So just because she's been pregnant doesn't mean she's got that many children, usually far from it. Okay. Let's talk about twinning. This is an interesting situation. There's two kinds. Twins are when two offspring are produced. Sometimes it takes one out of every 87 statistically times a woman in the United States ovulates, she will produce not one egg, but two eggs. She'll make enough FSH to produce two eggs. And those two eggs will be fertilized by two separate sperm they will give rise to two individual embryos. They could be two brothers or two sisters, or a brother and a sister, and they are no, genetically no more kin to each other than any two brothers and sisters born separately. Yeah, that's two eggs that give rise to two embryos or two zygotes, fertilized eggs. So that's called two zygote or dizygotic, D-I-Z-Y-G-O-T-S-C. Uh, it's not identical, it's fraternal twinning, fraternal or dizygotic twins. But that's relatively, yeah, common. 86 out of 87 twins are going to be that way, but uh, one out of every 87 twin pairs will be from the same egg. Hmm, how did that happen? Well, one sperm fertilized one egg and in the process of developing, it grew something called a second inner cell mass. We'll talk about that in a little while, but just write it down for right now or w w remember it. A second inner cell mass. In the last lecture, we talked about embryonic development in a chicken. Well, it turns out that it's very similar to, in some instances, to what happens in a mammal embryo when it grows. We talked about a primitive streak forming in the chicken embryo early on, well, it turns out that in a mammal, there is also a primitive streak that develops, and sometimes there will be two primitive streaks that develop, and each one will give rise to an identical twin to the other one. Why identical? Because they had the same chromosomes from papa and mama in both of them, the same genes. They are the same individual from an immunological standpoint, okay? identical twins, or from one egg, one zygote was produced, and that's called a monozygotic twin set. Okay, and that only happens one out of, oh, uh, well, uh, it's, it's relatively rare. Let's see if I can, I've got it down here. Um, monozygotic from winds, three quarters of twins that are born in the United States are dizygotic, one quarter are monozygotic. Okay, that's good. 
Um, let's see. I guess we should go on ahead. Um, we could talk about, this would be a good point for us to talk about, fertilization, because that's what's going to happen right here. And in order for us to do that, we need to go ahead and take a look at the female reproductive tract. So we'll change and go to that. OK. When ovulation occurs, it is an instantaneous event. Ovulation causes an egg to be released from an ovary in a rather explosive pop like a balloon full of fluid bursting, and out comes all the fluid, and in the process, out comes the egg. Uh, some women say that they can feel a little twinge in their abdomen when that happens. Um, there aren't any nerves on the surface of that ovary. So she's not feeling the actual popping. What she's feeling is coming out with that egg is some follicular fluid, and it is full of some rather high energy active molecules called cytokines. And when the cytokines come into contact with smooth muscle tissue, they cause it to cramp. Um, OK, that's this referred pain is what it's called. Yeah, it's sort of like what happens when you get ice cream on your soft pellet in your mouth, and you get a headache for all of a sudden. Ice cream isn't uh, touching your forehead at all, but it sure hurts because it's referred pain. Well, the little twinge that women feel is caused by the fact that the cytokines, which come out in the follicular fluid, can cause smooth muscle tissue around inside their abdomen to kind of contract and twinge just a little bit. Um, I've never heard anybody who says that it's debilitating or very painful. Now, uh, when sperm are deposited in the female reproductive tract, they find themselves inside the vaginal canal right here. And in order for the sperm to get to the egg, to fertilize the egg, the sperm is going to have to make it out of the vagina, up through a little narrow tube right here at the base of the uterus called the cervix, the cervical canal is about an inch and a quarter long, a quarter inch long, one and a quarter inch long. And in a nulliparous female, meaning she's never been pregnant before, it has the diameter of a pencil lid. Okay, it's about that big <laughs> in diameter. The sperm have to swim up through that, but that thing is clogged with very dense cervical mucus and acts just like a cork and prevents sperm from getting through unless the woman is one of two things, menstruating, in which case the clog of cervical mucus goes away, or right around day 14 when she ovulates, she is, that, she is vulnerable at that time to becoming pregnant because the cervical mucus right in here thins out. Instead of being thick and gooey and impenetrable by the sperm, it becomes thin and watery and actually helps the sperm to guide it, the sperm as they swim out of the vagina up into the cavity of the uh, inside of her uterus. Now, sperm, upon ejaculation of the male, find themselves in one of the most inhospitable places that they could possibly be. The most acidic fluids in a person's body would be in their stomach. Hydrochloric acid with a pH of 1.5, very, very acidic. Yeah. But the second most acidic human area where acid would accumulate is in the vagina. Vaginal fluid has a pH of 2.0, just slightly less acidic than hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And so when sperm find themselves in a vagina, most of them are killed within a minute or two. 
and it, in the droplets of sperm, the semen that are there, the uh, dead ones form a kind of crust around the droplets, protecting the live ones that are on the inside. And they're the only ones that have any chance of making it up through the cervix and into the endometrium where it's not as acid, probably not nowhere near as acidic up in the endometrium, up in there, as it is down here. OK. Um, oh, by the way, this cervical mucus plug only thins out and gets watery around day 14 of a woman's cycle. But what if you could give her some hormone or something that made that plug stay thick and viscous and impenetrable by sperm even on day 14 for the whole month, except for the menstrual period? Yeah, then you could pretty well prevent sperm from getting out of the site of deposition in the vaginal um, vestibule down in here, up into the in, inside of the, uh, the cavity up in the uterus. And that's one of the two ways that the birth control pill works. First of all, it tricks a woman into acting as if she's already pregnant so she doesn't make an egg. And secondly, even if that fails, it prevents the cervical mucus from ever getting thin and watery and so it acts as a stop to the sperm motility, and they never make it up here, even though there might be an egg out here someplace. OK, let's look at a newly ovulated egg. There's an ovum, and around it is this zona pellucida that we talked about with its species specificity. On the outside of that is a thick layer of a multiple cell layer of follicle cells held together by by a, a glue-like material, hyaluronic acid. And we've already talked about how a hyaluronidase in the acrosome of a sperm eats away those cells until they get so thin a layer that one sperm can make it through. It takes at least 200 sperm attacking this before one of them will have a chance to get in. And so we see that. Um, if a male is not producing a significant number of sperm, he doesn't stand much of a chance of having a fertilization event, causing a fertilization event. In our infertility clinic, we say that a guy has to have at least 60 million sperm, 3 milliliters of semen, with at least 20 million per milliliter, or else he is functionally sterile. 60 million sperm in a semen ejaculate should be enough to get the job done. But it turns out that's just too few. Yeah, because of the high attrition rate. Remember, sperm can't swim in a straight line. They just swim randomly here and there. They have no guidance system, no brain telling them what to do. There's nothing helping them to know which way to swim. They just swim whichever direction they happen to be pointed in. And so you have to have a very large number of sperm in order for just random access, some of them to finally make it so that at least 200 of them make it up to right here. They've got to go all the way out through the oviduct out to the distal or outer one third of the oviduct where they will come into contact within the first 24 hours after the egg comes out of the ovary. It's during that. 24 hours, that first 24 hours out in the distal one-third of the oviduct that everybody in here got started, either in mama's left or right oviduct. OK. Um, well, let's continue on here. Uh, if a sperm could swim in a straight line, the distance from here in a human to here is about um, 180 millimeters. That's 18 centimeters. That's that far. But see, they can't swim in a straight line. They swim in circles and randomly, every which way. So by the time sperm have meandered and wandered around and some of them made it up to here, it may be up to 24 hours later. A human sperm, a human egg, is still fertilizable, has a window of fertility, fertilizability, of at least 24 hours. Yeah. 
Now, this is internal fertilization, remember. In external fertilization, go back and study the frog development, and you'll see that once the frog female uh, oviposits her eggs out into the water, Papa Frog had better be Johnny on the spot because within 30 seconds, those eggs are going to become unfertilizable. The window of fertilizability for external fertilization is something on the order of 30 seconds. Here, 24 hours. So internal fertilization hmm, has its advantages. Now, um, sperm can't swim in a straight line and if they were sprinting going as fast as they possibly could go, they could only go approximately two millimeters a minute, which means that's 90 minutes it would take for them to go. If they could be guided and were real sprinters to make it from here to here in 90 minutes, it just doesn't happen. Okay. Now then, oh, by the way, you have to have a significant number of sperm deposited in the female reproductive tract in order for there to be um, a, a fertilization event. Um, about 15% of American marriages are infertile. Now, if they come to our infertility clinic and we take a look at why, we do all kinds of tests, about 40% of the time, almost, it's his problem. He's got a plumbing problem or a hormone problem or something and he's just not making um, sperm somehow. Something's wrong and he's just not producing enough sperm. About another 40% of the people who come to us, it's her problem. Possibly she has a blocked oviduct or something. That's very common with some of the um, illnesses that women and men too have. Um, there, that leaves approximately 20% of the couples that come to us. And 15 of those 20%, it's a problem between them. It's a them problem, not a him or a her problem. But it's a them problem. It is a problem that they have an incompatibility and would probably each be fertile with another partner. Then there's that very last 5%. And um, we have a name for it because we do every test in the book to try and figure out why they're not getting pregnant. Oh, they're trying. Have been for years in a lot of cases. But why aren't they getting pregnant? And every test comes back, no, nah, that's not why. That's not it. So we have a term, and the term is idiopathic infertility. Idiopathic infertility, I have not a good definition for it except for the following gesture. I don't know. We can't tell what's going on. We have no clue why these people are not getting pregnant. Everything works out and looks good. But in approximately, oh, 5% of marriages, we could, we could find this. Idiopathic infertility. It's an amazing thing. We suggest that they would be perfect people to adopt a child because it appears that they're not going to be able to have one. And you wouldn't believe how many times a year later after they adopt a kid, we get a phone call and Mrs. Somebody says, um, you're not going to believe what's happened. I'm pregnant. Sometimes the condition sort of heals itself. <laughs> And we have no idea why. Idiopathic infertility, it's very rare, about 5% of the time. OK. Um, now let's talk about early stages of embryonic development. So we go here. This is a newly fertilized mammal egg, say a human. The follicle cells will have left by the time it starts down through her oviduct in a human it takes it three days for this embryo to go through a woman's oviduct now it has sat around inside her uterus cavity 
from day one, two, three, it was in the oviduct, but four, five, six, it was inside that uterine cavity and that didn't do a thing. It just sat there. But once it, once it leaves and gets uh, fertilized, the zygote looks like this and it has as its outer covering a zona pellucida, which eventually will also go away. Uh, the first cleavage plane, which occurs out in the distal one-third of the oviduct, is going to be holoblastic, two equal size um, mitosis produced. From this point on, all cell divisions, until they start making, this individual starts making its own gametes at puberty, all cell divisions in their body will be M-I-T-O-S-I-S, -I not meiosis, but mitosis. Um, as the embryo travels those three days through the female's oviduct, days seven, eight, and nine, it goes through the various stages that we have talked about, the cleavage stages, the morula, little berry stage, and then it becomes a blastula. And once it becomes a blastula, then things really start perking. Okay? Here is a blastula from a mammal. And you will notice that the blastocele here, this is figure D, yep. This is called a blastocyst in some literature because it is cyst-like in that it is a holosphere that is full of fluid, a cyst. It is made of cells on the outside a blastocele on the inside, but snuggled up against one side right here will be a lump called the inner cell mass, a lump of cells, and they are destined to become the embryo. Whereas this layer of cells right here, they are called trophoblast cells, and they are destined to become the placenta, the covering around the embryo or fetus as it's growing inside mama. Okay. On, oh, I told you a while ago that one of the two ways that you could get identical twinning, monozygotic twins, would be for this inner cell mass to split into one here and one here, into two inner cell masses, and that'll give rise to identical twins. The other way was to grow two primitive streaks, but that's not here. Anyway, at this point, on about day, oh, say nine, well, starting at day six, it is going to snuggle up to the wall on the inside of mama's uterus, her endometrium wall. And there it will begin the process of dissolving its way into her layer, her outermost layer, the endometrial layer of her, of her uterus. Let's look at the tissues that are in, a, say, a human uterus. First of all, there is a very large, I have it brown here, smooth muscle layer. This is the layer of smooth muscle. Remember, there are three kinds of muscle, cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is found anywhere there is muscle that's a component of a tube in the body, and this is a tube right here. Smooth muscle cannot contract vigorously. Well, it can't contract quickly, but it can contract with a lot of, of force. It's not a sports car, it's a bulldozer, okay? Can't go fast, but boy does it have power. And so when time comes for birth to occur, this smooth muscle layer out here begins to clamp down and will eventually force the fetus out of the uterus in the birth process. But when we're talking about how the embryo develops, we are not talking about the smooth muscle layer. We're talking about the layer that lines the inside cavity here called endometrium. It's kind of red in the drawing here. The endometrium basically has four parts. It has a basal layer right here of cells. Now when menstruation occurs, and this tissue sloughs off and is lost out to the outside, sloughed away. 
The basal layer is the only layer of this endometrium that stays back, and that does not slough off. But everything else, this spongy layer of endometrium, this compact layer of endometrium, and this outermost layer of epithelial cells on the outer, all of those are lost in the menstrual event. Okay. And that means that the new basal, the basal layer has to begin the process of regrowing all three of these layers right here again. And that takes place during the first uh, 14 days of a woman's new cycle. Remember, I gave you some didactic little punch phrases that I wanted you to remember about endometrium, estrogen, and progesterone. We said that estrogen regrows the endometrium and progesterone maintains the endometrium. Yeah, and if there is no pregnancy, you don't make enough progesterone and you don't maintain the endometrium and it sloughs off and starts over a new cycle again. Well, starting at about mm, the end of day six, the beginning of day seven in the embryo's life, it will snuggle up to here, and it will begin to dissolve its way literally up into the tissues of the endometrium to eat its way in. Yeah, that's uh, kind of an interesting situation. It's called implantation. Let's take a look at implantation. Now, the fancy name for implantation, if you are a biologist or a physician or something, is nidation. Implantation takes starting at day seven all the way up through about day 12. And during that time, these trophoblast cells that are on the outside out here, not the inner cell mass, but the trophoblast cells, okay, that are going to become the placenta, some of them begin to become syncytial. We have already explained that in one lecture. That's where a group of cells get together lump up, and all of them lose their outer cell membrane and they just become one big gump lump of goo, of protoplasm. But the nuclei that were from all the cells are still plastered up on the inside of that lump of goo. And that lump of goo is called a syncytium. Well, turns out that some of these trophoblast cells become syncytial. And we call those syncytiotrophoblasts. And see, here's a nucleus from one. There's a nucleus there, 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 there. But there are some trophoblasts that retain their cellular outer membrane, and those are called cytotrophoblasts. So we've got syncytial trophoblast, and we have cytotrophoblast that are in the process of dissolving and digesting their way into the endometrium tissue and pulling, nidating, or pulling the embryo up with them. And by day 12, we see that the embryo will have completely covered itself over with maternal endometrium tissue. So it looks like this. By day 12, we see that the syncytiotrophoblast will have eaten their way in with some trophoblastic invasions called villi, or a single one is a villus. That's going to be real important in our next uh, lecture when we talk about placentas. It's kind of interesting. Anyway, the trophoblastic villus will have a bunch of cytotrophoblasts, the ones that don't become syncytial, the brown ones here, that move up and will form a finger-like projection that grows up inside there called a villus. Uh, okay. And those are going to be very, very important in forming a placenta, a connection device between maternal blood system and fetal blood system. Now, maternal blood and fetal blood are never, never allowed to mix. Maternal blood never does flow directly into a fetal blood vessel. No. Nope. The oxygen that's in mama's blood cells has to go across a barrier called a placenta and get into the blood cells of the fetus, and the waste material in the fetus blood cell blood has to go across a barrier to get to the maternal blood where it can be taken to her kidneys and gotten rid of. This 
is growing. We're definitely into our pregnancy now. We're at day 14 plus 12 days. That's uh, day 26. And remember the, the, uh, the menstrual, most calendars for most women would be about day 28 days. So this is within two days of being expelled if menstruation were to take place. And sometimes it does. And we get a, a miscarriage. There's a, a structure that develops up inside these villi right there that we need to talk about because it will be very, very important when we discuss placentas in our next lecture. Here we see a trophoblastic villus. It's one of these invasive little areas. It is made of syncytial trophoblast eating their way up into mother's uterine endometrium. And inside of it, there will be a kind of a hollow cone-like area surrounding by, surrounded by cytotrophoblast. Inside of that, there will be fetal blood vessels, blood vessels that lead down to the fetus, to the embryo. Okay, and inside of that will be fetal blood. Now, maternal blood is out here in the endometrium, and the placenta is the structure that's going to have to develop so that oxygen from mama's blood can get to the blood cells down in the fetal blood vessel, like that, and we'll have to go through this outer membrane right there. And that's what the next um, lecture is going to be mostly about cytotrophoblast, uh, syncytial trophoblast, and trophoblastic villi that force their way up into mother's endometrium tissue and start getting nourishment from her, oxygen from her blood, taking their, its carbon dioxide from fetal blood and giving it over to, across the placenta to mama, and uh, then from there out. Eventually, Embryo going to start looking like this. This is three weeks development. The embryo is beginning to take shape at this point. Notice we have a neural plate here. Yeah, where have we seen that from ectoderm underneath it? There's that notochord. Hey, where did we see that before? The yolk sac down here will be lined with endoderm, right there. This, there will be a primitive um, elongated strip of tissue right here. And, oh dear, somebody's calling me. Anyway, um, we see that the major parts that we saw in the chicken embryo development are going to be mimicked here on this plate in the mammal embryo. All right, now we're going to look at um, a little bit later stage in the pregnancy development. And here we see something that comes along about three weeks into development. There will be a elongated rod that grows right along the top here of this tissue. Down underneath it will be endoderm, in the middle will be mesoderm, ectoderm will be on top. A primitive streak will form across through there sometimes. Something interesting will happen in that the primitive streak will go up and then it will divide into a Y shape. Or sometimes it will divide itself into an X shaped, two primitive streaks attached at a point right in the middle. And when we do that, we have incomplete twinning, sometimes called Siamese twins, or incomplete twinning, but that's very, very rare. In this, we see um, the, the four extra embryonic tissues, sacs, that are going to be formed, the amnion and the chorion, chorion and the amnion, are destined to be covered with somatoplure, whereas the allantois 
and the yolk sac are destined to arise from splenchnoplure, as you will remember from our last lecture. Okay? And so, at three weeks development, what we have is an embryo that is beginning to get, well, it's about the size of um, a BB, about that big in diameter at this point, has the consistency of jello. Okay? There's nothing dense about it at all. It's mostly goo at this point. And this body stalk that develops right here is destined to become the umbilical cord that attaches the embryo to the placenta all around it. All right? And when we get through with that development and get from three weeks to four weeks, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see an embryo, it's a month old, and it is about one-fifth of an inch in diameter, the consistency of jello, one-fifth of an inch, which means you could line five of them up, to, up together and they would, form, they would go about an inch. At this point, though, this thing begins to protrude out back into mama's uh, antrocavity, the cavity inside her um, uterus right here. Okay, um, it's very small, but at this juncture, at four weeks of development, we can see that the embryo is now completely enclosed in its own amnion, and will develop some fluid that it floats in inside that amnion. The amniotic fluid is the fluid that breaks right before birth and comes out as the amnion membrane breaks. Okay, there will be a yolk sac and an allantois and also a chorion, the outer chorional ectoderm all the way around here. Um, this is the point at which we are beginning to develop a rather sophisticated, not fundamental, but rather in intricate parts of the embryo. And so we will talk about that as we proceed into another lecture later on. Make sure I've gotten everything that I need to. It is called a blastocyst, as I told you because it is a hollow cavity. It's not hollow, it's full of fluid, a cyst, okay. And uh, although implantation starts on day six, at the end, by the end of day 28, four weeks, it is well on its way. And this chorion right here is making a very special product called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG for short. Now this stuff that's being made, HCG, only occurs if there is a pregnancy in a person's body. It is never made in an unpregnant body by any tissue anywhere. That is the stuff that you look for in an early pregnancy test. And it begins to show up a couple of three weeks after the embryo implants. So by the fourth week, it is definitely making plenty of HCG, so much so that a lot of it spills over into the woman's urine out of her blood serum. And uh, it can be detected in a urine test strip. Okay, The fourth week embryo. And from there, it will grow for the next approximately nine months. Um, that basically is the material that we want to talk about. Let's see. I think that does it. So we will call an end to this lecture. I thank you very much. Next time, placentas.